just get ready tonight. Are you re- I don't think you're ready. I don't think you know how to, I don't know how to get you ready. But anyway, Dan, come on up and share with them. You're amazing. Thanks so much, sir. Hey, buddy. Bless you. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Okay. Yeah. Where'd you go, Tom? I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray. All right. Thanks, guys. Yeah. So, Father, thank you so much for this man who's just given his all to you and you've given your all to him. And Lord, I thank you for the message that he has, that the good news of the gospel really is going forth. I thank you, Lord for just what's going to happen here tonight. Holy Spirit, we honor you. We honor your presence. And we say thank you again for what you're going to do, the, the spontaneity. And yet, Lord, you're drawing from not just off the cuff. You're drawing from years of him walking from, with you and, uh, and learning through every situation, every trial, every testimony, every, th- every time you've worked through him, Lord. I thank you for the, the teaching of the Holy Spirit that is on him. And, Lord, we ask that that would bear amazing multiplied fruit in this room and on the internet and wherever people are listening in jesus name amen amen thank you buddy yeah hey good evening guys thanks for being so loving yeah man what a fun time so far huh i felt like what a solid meeting like gathering i i mean i know you all jumped up and hey i'm gonna preach and stuff but Really, like, I got enough, like, here tonight, I could have just left here and just stayed on point, you know what I mean? (laughs) Serious. Like, the worship time, what a great group of guys. Like, you felt that in the room, corporate, like, ah, some of them songs? Shoo, some were, some of that one song about him in the grave and the earth shaking and he's, and it was just all about him being amazing and defeating death and, and then there was one about our victory in him where we're clean and we're free and we're righteous and you just feel the room like, oh, and then we go, oh, and I was like, whoa, this is pretty cool. So then we get up and do the testimonies, people living in Jesus, walking in Jesus and loving like Jesus. And I was like, I think I'm encouraged we ought to just go live Jesus. So we'll see y'all tomorrow, I think 9 o'clock. Because <laughs> we just had church, man. <laughs> oh, I'm just pumped. And then you said something, pray, and you said, this man who gave, you know, all, all, all that he is to you, and you gave him all that you are. And he doesn't know this, but Holy Spirit, that was the first prayer Holy Spirit taught me when I got saved. I would stand in my bedroom and say, I give you all that I am, Lord. I yield to you and give you everything I am so that all that you are, you can be in me. See, now I'm going to talk straight to you. Now I'm shifting. I feel this serious thing coming on me, but I'll keep smiling. But (laughs) nothing else is Christianity. You don't just give him your sins. You don't just give him your past. You don't just give him your talents. You give him all that you are. You give him everything that you are so that everything he is can be in you. We're not just here to benefit from him. We're here to be filled with him and manifest him. We're here to live in the spirit and walk in the light as he's in the light. For so long, we've made Christianity something we gain because of him. Something we get because it's something we become. Christianity is something we become. And, and, and life in the spirit is amazing. Walking in love is, is just ridiculously fun. I don't even know how you put it into words because love takes no account of a suffer wrong. It doesn't seek its own. So every emotion, every perverted emotion that self-centeredness brings into a person's life, disappears when you walk in love. So you're never trying to be okay because you're just in him. I can tell that you didn't get that. No, I can tell. No, because we're too busy thinking the way we've been is the way we are and always going to be. No, it's a perverted, messed up scene, man. Self-centeredness is zero kingdom. Self-centered is zero kingdom. All about me is zero kingdom. Well, what about me? Zero kingdom. Zero. It has nothing to do with truth, has nothing to do with God's intention, has nothing to do with God's plan. It has to do with deception, the fall of man, and sin. And Jesus said, hey, if you're going to follow me, there's something you got to do. you got to deny yourself because it's the biggest mess on the earth. It's the biggest lie. It's the biggest perversion. And here's the deal. When you're living for yourself, all your motives are perverted. Everything channels through the wellspring of your motive. And when self-centeredness is at the foundation, anxiety, fear, frustration, offense, discouragement, 
All those things are prevalent and normal because of the motive of your life. So it's not normal. It's not something we're trying to get a grip on and discipline and control. The Bible says you put it off and then you put something new on. So I used to wake up and live for me, think for me. I used to like you for me. I used to do good to you for me. I used to say I love you for me. Time to deny ourselves. Pick up our cross. Never again let sin against us produce sin in us. Never again get betrayed and live betrayed. Never again repay evil for evil. You overcome evil with good. Why? Because you denied yourself. It's not about what you've been through. It's about what he's been through, and that's where you find truth. You don't find yourself in you and in life and in others. You find yourself through the one that gave you life. You're not trying to find your identity being treated right. You've been treated beyond right. So you put on Jesus, people. And you say, you know what? I'm on the earth for one reason. I'm on the earth to shine. I'm on the earth to walk in the light as he's in the light. And it has nothing to do with how anybody treats me or doesn't because he has shown me the truth because he is the truth. And I'm going to live in it and I'm going to walk in it because I found him there. And he's love and I'm going to walk in love. You get it? (laughs) So, if in prayer I learn to deny myself and in prayer I understand all that you are, Lord, you be in me. Tom prayed that prayer over me, and it, it, it made me giggle because I said, well, that was my first little prayer. I give you everything that I am. I lay down my life, and I give you all that I am so that all that you are, you can be in me. So wonder if, I'm not against gifting. It's scriptural. But wonder if it's not all about you pursuing gifting. Wonder if Christ gives gifts to men. Wonder if gifting is all in him and the expression of him. Wonder Wonder if the excellent way really is love. And wonder if in that place, all that I am is yours and all that you are be in me. So in a nine month period before I was even a year old, I experienced every spiritual gift in the Bible and couldn't even teach on them. Didn't even have any Christian terms. Had no Bible teaching, had no supernatural training. I just was alone when you weren't looking. Sincere as could be, saying all that is yours is mine and all that is mine is yours. And made this exchange from sincerity. And all of a sudden, everything changed about my motive in life. And all of a sudden, I found that I wasn't offended anymore. I didn't have first impressions that were negative. I, judgments left my I've never tried to change. I didn't bite my lip to be okay. And I didn't have to struggle. All of a sudden, it was just in my perspective. It was, in, it was change. And all of a sudden I realized, oh my goodness, I really am waking up to shine. I'm waking up for your glory. I'm I'm living for your great name and for the sake of others. And I don't have to try to change. I I don't know how to be hurt now, discouraged now. The things that I thought were normal, I realized were perverted. So I'm not even a year old, 10, 12 people a day calling my house for counsel. I'm not a year old in the Lord. And I realize it's all this people stuff, getting by, getting through, getting around, trying to stay okay. And I'm thinking, man, you're never going to be okay if it's all about you. Come on, it's one thing to sing it's all about him. It's another thing to live it's all about him. Let's not just learn to sing. Well, Tom would do him good if he'd learn to sing. But (laughs) that's not us. That's not us. Learn to sing. Just learn to sing. I love you, buddy. (laughs) <laughs> Me and Heidi, Heidi and I were laughing when we were doing that sing thing because I said, he is going to be the worship leader in heaven. <laughs> the Lord is going to say, you did not have it on the earth, pal. You were dead last. You will be first. <laughs> in heaven. Tom is going to be rocking it. I'm going to be... Tom. <laughs> So here's what I started to realize when I got saved. I'm just, I don't even know where we were going really here. I just, if it don't work, it was Tom's prayer. So this is Tom night. (laughs) No, I started to realize I was totally different. I started to realize it wasn't about trying to love my wife, trying to be okay, trying to treat her right, trying to give what she deserves. 
You just start seeing the value of everybody when you see the truth about who he is in you and who you're called and created to be. All of a sudden, you really understand love God with everything you are and love your neighbor as yourself because you finally have a healthy view. You see yourself clear in him, and you got the best view of the room. And all of a sudden, you realize everybody's worth the blood. Everybody's worth transformation. Everybody's worth mercy and forgiveness. And everybody's worth everything he gave me. Like, why would I want to receive from him something I'm not willing to be in your life? That would be self-centered right there. You want to be forgiven of everything you've ever done, and you don't want to forgive somebody a wrong, but you just expect the person of God to forgive you because it said he's forgiveness? Well, he made you in his image. He told you to walk in the light as he's in the light. He said, the things I do, you'll do. And as he is, so are you in this world. He said, follow me. Yeah, he didn't just say sing to me, he didn't just say need me. He said, follow me. Come on. These testimonies are amazing. If you're all caught up with other things, you don't see the people around you. If you're caught up with other things, you get self-conscious, it kind of veils you in the way of faith and outside. You, all of a sudden, it's just about you getting by, you feeling better. You catching a break, you praying for a breakthrough. The stones rolled away. Listen. A healthy view is your breakthrough. Your breakthrough is in the midst of adversity, understanding why you're alive. That, that's your breakthrough. Your breakthrough is truth. Truth is what makes you free. You, we think our circumstance in changing is our breakthrough. No, no, it's when I see through him. That's my breakthrough. When I got the best view of you, when I see my life in purpose, when I see why the Spirit of God is in me and why Jesus really shed his blood, and I understand this gift called life, not grind, gift called life. <sighs> That's freedom. Come on. I contain the passion to express it, and I know it looks like I'm passionate. Just, I'm just partially what I, I push that down so that I can communicate, and I'm 25 years in, because nothing has the right to touch this truth. It doesn't, it can't even get close, Chris. Nothing can stop what I see and believe. I'm 25 years in, and I'm as passionate, I'm probably more. My friends that see me, I haven't seen before, they said, you're worse, dude. <laughs> I'm, why? Because I'm more convinced. I've been through more life. I've had plenty more opportunities to be something else. Come on, I'm not passionate and excited every day because everything's going the way I'm hoping. It's because he's the same. It's not because everybody's treating me right and saying the right things and doing all kinds of nice stuff. It's so good. Oh, it's so good, dude. I'm done for life. Like the rest of my life, I'm in. I'm, I'm going to be on point. You can't touch it. Nobody can touch it. You can't do me enough wrong to change the truth of why I woke up this morning. And if I let, if I let what you do trump what he did and what you say trump what he said, I'm way deceived. And all of a sudden, I'm living for him to make things go the way I hope instead of living for him to fill me with who he is so I can be what he is in the midst of it all. Are you all with me? Come on. And I'm going to make a bold statement since you all seem excited. Nothing else is really Christianity. We've just made it a lot of other things. The Christianity is very narrow. Narrow is the way. And it actually says in Scripture that few are those who find it. He's not talking about a prayer and confession of salvation to go to heaven. He's talking about the way. He's talking about the path you travel. There's a way that seemeth right to a man, never once produces life. Every time, death. The way that seemeth right to a man. That's our way, but then you got the way. And that way is love, and he modeled that life for me. He walked this thing out, man. He didn't just come and preach to me. He, the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and he said, follow this. He was done wrong beyond, beyond. The biggest act of injustice that will ever happen to a human being was Jesus. Come on, he was crucified for, for being absolutely flawless. 
His motives are crystal squeaky clean pure. There's not one slant to a mindset, to a motive. He is clean. What fascinates me and sobers me, and it should humble us all, that he spoke to people for three years the absolute truth, and they killed him for what he said. That men were so deceived through the fall and so wise in their own opinion and so proud in their own puffed-up intellect and human reasoning that truth itself, that was from the beginning, Jesus Christ stood in front of them and spoke, and they couldn't hear what he said, and they crucified him for what he said. It's amazing that you can get so far deceived. He said, like six times in chapter Matthew 5, you say, but I say. You say, but I say. What's he saying? You ain't saying what I'm saying. <laughs> You've been trained by a lie. You, you got, call no man on earth your teacher. You got one teacher. He's the Christ. Don't call any man on earth your father. That doesn't mean it's wrong to send dad a Father's Day card, people. What he's saying is don't limit, identify, and regulate your life through natural means, hereditary, biological inheritance. You have one father, and he's in heaven. You can't even say to me anymore, well, you know, my dad, we're not talking about your dad. We're talking about God the Father, and I'm sorry your dad wasn't loving, but God was really loving and sent his son while you were yet a sinner. Why are you letting an unloving dad keep you from an over-the-top loving God? Why are you even making it simulate because they're both called Father? I've been saved 25 years. One of the biggest stumbling blocks is relating our life to him and him to our life instead of saying, whoa, what is this? Blah, and relate to him. What's it matter if I didn't have a loving home? What's it matter if I had a rough childhood and background? Christ has come. He raised from the dead and said, hey, boy, you're a whole lot more than what everybody put you through and how you responded. How about coming over here, call that dead. I'll wash it clean through the blood. Don't ever look back because you're not Lot's wife. You're getting married to me. Look up from where comes your help, and I'm going to put a robe on you, and we're going to walk together forever. Come on. And then we're going to say, yeah, but it still hurts. What? No, that's, that's unbelief. That's letting something matter more than what matters most. That's letting life speak louder than truth. If I have a present and a things to come in 2 Corinthians 3, and I have a present and a things to come in Romans 8 that doesn't separate me from the love of God, why is the past even in the equation? He bought it out and threw it in the sea called forgetfulness. He gave me a present and things to come. Why? Because the moment before I got saved, I was dead, and now I got new life. I was born again. So I have no history through that transformation. I come through that thing clean. Brand new baby boy presented to the father. Ain't he awesome? <laughs> never touched by sin. A restored innocence. God sees me as if I've never eaten the tree. Come on, I can show you all those Christian words. Justification, just as you ever sinned. Righteous, standing before God without any sense of, sense of guilt, condemnation, shame. Colossians 1, reconciled through the body of his death, presented holy, blameless, above reproach in his sight. Not in his doctrine. It's not positional, it's personal. Yeah. Oh, man. Holy, blameless, and above reproach in his sight. Now God's going to tell me that the blood is so powerful, speaking better things than the blood of Abel, which Mark came for the rest of his life. The blood of Jesus is going to set me free and mark me for righteousness, and I'm going to get my feelings hurt by somebody that doesn't know God. I'm going to get offended and understand this truth. Come on. I'm not being mean right now. Christians struggling with offense, you just need a stronger gospel. You're not understanding the finished work. You're waiting for people to change, and in the process, you're letting them change you. See, God could never be changed. You couldn't change God over generations of sin and rebellion and waywardness. You couldn't change God. The Israelites in the wilderness, pretty redundant story if you look at it, couldn't change God. He's the same. No, no turning, no shifting or shadow. He's a rock. Oh, 
He hasn't changed. Watch. Why he made man hasn't changed. Our potential, our destiny, purpose in God hasn't changed. No matter how far you ran this way, how far you ran that way, while you're, why you are here, the why behind why you're here is the same. No matter how lost you live, no matter how many years you seem to piddle away, God hasn't changed and the truth about who he wants to be in you is the same. That's why a man could run wayward as hard as possible, break and look up and God's right there. Why? He's mercy and he triumphs over judgment and he doesn't give people what they deserve. He gives them what they're created for through the blood of Jesus that speak in better things. You, so, so, so am I going to preach that so we just, oh, I'm forgiven. No, no, no. Wow, I'm freaked out. I'm forgiven of everything I've ever done. Now you better believe that. You've got to believe that. Because see, when you don't receive forgiveness, then you don't forgive yourself. You're still guilty. You still have issues with regret. You still fight bouts of shame. And the trouble with it is, then you can never see the joy of true forgiveness, so it never rubs off on you, so you can become forgiveness. Because the goal of God forgiving you isn't you being forgiven. It's you becoming forgiveness. The goal of God loving you isn't so you're loved. It's so you're overwhelmed by the truth of it and become the very thing that rescued you. God doesn't give you mercy so you obtain it. It's so you're so affected by it, you become the most merciful being on the planet. Why? We're ambassadors. We're ambassadors of God. We're not Christians that attend meetings. Christian means little Christ-like ones. We're ambassadors of God. An ambassador fully represents what they represent. So we live our life and represent him. That's why these testimonies are so exciting. So exciting. You have to understand that. You stay humble, even in your gifting, even in... I loved watching you, man, in your testimonies. Portland, you're from Portland. The fellow from Portland is who I'm looking at, just so you have a, wasn't he awesome? Just so innocent and just happy in God, and he's telling stories, and I'm like, that's really good. <laughs> he just really blessed me. Just, I leaned over to Chris, I said, he is so sincere, it's like super ridiculously good. Just having a good time in Jesus. He's, 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 Going past a lady he's never seen and he just feels the overwhelming sense of the love of God for her. You don't hear that much in a testimony. I understand what he's talking about. It grabbed my attention. I went, oops, I like that. <laughs> so there's nothing ministry about it. He's not doing the ministry thing. He's not trying to manifest and activate the prophetic gift that lies within. He's just in fellowship with Jesus and excited to be alive and he sees that everybody's worth the blood and all of a sudden he looks at a lady he doesn't even know and has an overwhelming sense of love for her. Come on, that's Jesus. And all of a sudden he's here. Why? It's the excellent way. Paul said to desire the best gifts. That's what's ever needed in the moment. And then he said, yet yeah, let me show you more. If, if you read it in context, it's powerful. You can see him penning. And he says, therefore, earnestly desire the best gifts. And it's almost like he pauses. Still, yet, I'm going to show you a more excellent way. And he writes a whole chapter on love. And at the end of that chapter, he says, So pursue love and desire spiritual gifts. What's first? Who is love? So pursue him. Get to know him. Be one with him. Give all that you are so that all that he is and then you see things for people, because he sees things. And all of a sudden, he can entrust you with info. And you're not just pursuing gifting, because that's dangerous. Because then they'll introduce you as the male reader, and they'll be pulling all their friends up to see if you get a word. And, and it's just a lot of times, it's just about the word and the prophecy. And, but man, when it's just the overwhelming sense of love, and you get little insights, the people are wrecked because they know it's him. They so know it's him. I just loved watching you share your testimonies. 
I liked them all, man. Were they all like over the top or what? Those two ladies that got up there together, I was like, <laughs> I was just, I was ready to go. I could have went back to my room and just said, you know what? We just had a great encouraging time. We ought to just go live Jesus, go to bed with him, wake up with him, just stay one with him. We sh we're good, we're good. I could have got up here and said, we're good. Let's just go, man. But now that I'm up here, I'm just encouraging a few things. Self-centeredness is the biggest trap on the planet. The biggest problem isn't who the president is or is going to be. It's not racial conflict. It's not terrorism. The biggest problem on the planet is that every day, man wakes up and lives for himself when he's created for God's image. And it causes the greatest chaos on the earth. Because you can't see clear. You can't respond clear. And you can't live clear. When the water's that muddy. Because selfishness and love are total opposites. Yeah. And when you look in scripture, you find zero self-centeredness in love. And you find zero love in self-centeredness. There's no marriage between the two. There's no marriage between yes and no. Let your yes be yes. And your no be no. So you can't say, well, I mean, I'm kind of, I mean, I love sometimes. Sometimes it's just tough. You know how it is. I mean, brother, I think we all have lines, you know, people. And all of a sudden you start rationalizing and reasoning into some compromise and try to create a marriage where there can never be one. One of the, one of the greatest damages among us, because I'm not talking to a room of hypocrites. You didn't come here because you're a hypocrite. You came here because you want to grow in Jesus and you want to walk in Jesus. You want to live in Jesus. I'm not here to correct you and spank you. I'm here to encourage you and cheer you on and show you what he paid and who we can be, Right? But yes and no, let your yes be yes, your no be no. Anything else is of the evil one. So we've mixed yes and no in our gospel in a lot of t hot topics. We've mixed it in healing. Maybe he will, maybe he won't. What's happened? You prayed for somebody and they died. You changed your theology and you didn't even realize. Now you came up with a maybe he will, maybe he won't. What'd you do? You didn't let your yes be yes and your no be no. You let your circumstance change the truth that was revealed through his life. And you let your circumstance decide what you believe instead of his life. So now you married yes and no, and guess who their children are? Maybe so, maybe not. There's no marriage. Let your yes be yes. That's why we say maybe he will, maybe he won't, concerning the will of God. Maybe, well, if it be that, it's a cop-out. It's because we've married yes and no through the circumstances of life, through confusion, through unanswered prayer, and in a troubled heart, we've tried to come up with an analogy to explain what we're troubled over at the cost of truth. So a lot of times, at best, we're just trying to comfort ourselves. Why do we need comfort? Because it's more about us than his great name. Come on, these things aren't hard to discern. Let me ask you a straight and strong question, okay? Is it possible to be discouraged if there's zero self-centeredness and all you care about and think about is the kingdom of God and the sake of others? Is it possible to be discouraged? It's amazing how discouragement is so prevalent and so normal and we accept it as an everyday part of life and if we talk about not being discouraged, we think we're in denial. We've studied ourselves, we've studied our experiences, we've studied a fallen man, and we've worn it as an identity. And then we get tricked into bringing Jesus into it, hoping we can be the best we can be in the midst of all this, instead of putting it all off and putting something brand new on. Are you with me? See, when I talk like that, like every hair stands up. I, I'm like, <laughs> I'm manifesting way more than you understand. Way more. I got roosters crowing inside of me, and they ain't conviction roosters. They're barnyard banny roosters. <laughs> I'm ready, man. I mean, I feel the Holy Ghost on the inside. Just It feels like a lion inside me right now talking like this. Why? Because it makes you untouchable by life, because the giver of life has set you straight in the truth. And all of a sudden, you're not just tripping and making mistakes. And, well, he said, well, I don't know why. Well, it just hurts. Well, after a while, you can't tell me. Well, if God doesn't move soon, I don't know how long I can hold on. It's amazing how we let time change truth. 
when truth doesn't know time. Well, I love you for now. <laughs> you don't even know what love is when you talk like that. I understand sometimes situations mean you can't stay with a person because it's dangerous and because they're trying to cut you in the middle of your sleep, cut something off your body or something. <laughs> and sometimes you've got to get out of the situation. But be honest with me, it's very rare to not see the situation determine the person. The person is usually a product and expression of the story. It's amazing how we get out of that situation and throw the person away in the process. It's amazing how we've given up on each other. It's amazing how we know he'll never give up on us, but we're not convicted when we give up. It's amazing how we know he forgives me of everything I've ever done, and we actually have this idea, and he'll forgive me of everything I ever do. And then we hold our heart against someone. It really muddies the water. I'm telling you, God is crying out from the rooftops for the cleanest, most beautiful outpouring of God's spirit that generations man has ever experienced. I promise you, I, I, this isn't hype. I don't hype nothing like that. I don't even talk like this usually, but I see this. I don't say it much. I really believe that we have the greatest privilege that any generation has had. There's greater revelation than we've ever seen. We're understanding the why behind the cross. Two generations back, it was just pray a prayer and make sure you go to heaven. Just a generation back, it wasn't far from that. Are you kidding me? Pray a prayer to go to heaven? Heaven's coming into you. Heaven's coming into me. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. He's not just talking about no cancer in heaven, no cancer on earth. There's a truth there. I get it, and we should go after it. But there's no animosity, no backbiting, no pride, no frustration, no unresolved conflicts in heaven. There's no who's who and push and shove and my ministry and my badge and I need more time and why does he get to sing more than me and how come he can play... So we're doing church, giving ourselves away. We're serving in ministry at the risk of getting hurt if we're not appreciated like we think we deserve for the time we've laid down. So you got people that won't even go to church because they weren't appreciated, which means they didn't do what they did for love. Do you have to appreciate me for coming here? Do you have to appreciate me for what I do? Do you have to appreciate me for anything? See, it's so powerful when you're not appreciated and it doesn't change a thing because you didn't do nothing to be appreciated. And if nobody says thank you, you don't notice because you didn't do it to be thanked. And if you did it to be thanked and they said thank you, it fed a weakness and it kept a sickness alive. And then leaders do meetings in the behind the scenes called board meetings that say, make sure you encourage your people. You don't want them to just Make sure you stay conscious to give them a little and let them and tell them how you feel. Because it's like we're babying each other saying, if we don't keep you cheered on, you won't stay cheered on. I think we need to say, man, look, don't even sign up if your heart's not love. And if you could be let down by one of us and we don't thank you enough or give you the right certificate or trophy or acknowledgement and you're going to be set back, then I'd probably rather not have you sign up right now. Get a grip on your heart and get your motive pure so that nobody can ever hurt you in what you're doing because it's all before the Lord and for the sake of others. Come on, I'd be like Jesus having a pity party, man. Man, I can't believe it. I don't even want to go out there today, man. Man, these people don't appreciate me. Here when they're sick every day, they call me a devil. I've had about enough of it. I'll tell you, it put me over the top the other day. It was cool how, God, you multiplied all that food, but they could care less about what I have to say. Tracked me down, came across that water, and found me over there in my secluded little place just because they wanted another meal. They wanted to see another miracle. They could care less about what I got to say. In fact, I'll tell you what. If these people didn't change by now, they probably ain't never going to change. I used to say I love them. Now I ain't even sure I like them. Isn't it amazing you can't even see Jesus like that? You can't even picture Jesus like that. Jesus can't even be like that. It's not because he's Jesus. He can't not be like that because he's Jesus. 
It's because he's love. So if that ain't his language, where'd we get it? If he didn't teach us that language, how come we all learn it so well? I bet we were born into something else. I bet we were born into something we were never intended to be in. I bet we were born something totally opposite of what we were created for. And I bet we ought to all get born again. And I bet we turned that into a self-centered thing that benefits me and gives me eternal life and blessings and provision and protection. And if I don't get protection, I'm going to wonder why God didn't answer my prayer. I'll bet you we got this thing a little mixed up. I'll bet this thing never was about what we get from him. I bet it's about what we become because of him. I bet this isn't about the benefit of the Lord. I bet this is about the transformation of the Lord. I bet this is about the Lord snatching me out of darkness and putting me into the light. Get me out of the filthy lie of self-centered living so I could actually walk in a pure heart and see God and love people. Woo. I'll promise you nothing else is Christianity. Whatever men made it, whatever preachers made it, however we've misinterpreted this thing, this is the truth because it brings life and it keeps you steady till the day you die in this body and then you ain't dead anyway. So we're done fearing death. We're done fearing man. Jesus absolutely rocks and he's amazing and he lives in me and I'm sealed forever. Probably ought to run well. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. I just feel good about it. I think I'm going to stay a Christian. (laughs) I'm going to stay saved. (laughs) What are you saved from? You're saved from yourself. Come on. Forgiveness of sins isn't the end. Getting your name in the Lamb's Book of Life isn't the end. It's all just the beginning of a covenant relationship where you've died to yourself and you're alive unto Him where you deny yourself, pick up your cross, and you follow the king. Why is that so important? Because until Jesus came, we didn't know what truth was. He's the truth. He shot out of dry ground. He was a light in the darkness. We didn't know. Man, when he started speaking, they say, what is this dude talking about? This dude's a blasphemer. Who does he think he is? He don't think nothing. He knows. Right? And you're going to try to tell him why he ain't God's son and why God can't be his father. And there was so much religion on the earth and it was so puffed up in its own pride that it's trying to shout down the son of God and set him straight. I know people don't like when you say this, but you see that religion on the earth a lot today. People, about, people talk about the Bible a lot, but they're mean, they're mad, they're witch hunting, they're always fault finding. I'm convinced if Jesus was on the earth today, he'd get the same treatment. Facebook would blow up, the internet would blow up, Twitter would blow up, and they'd end up, people would crucify him in their hearts and minds. Love is amazing, people. And the reason it's amazing is because it doesn't seek its own. That's, that's my favorite description. Like you can read in Corinthians, and you can see the breakdown on love and what it is and define it. But the fact that it doesn't seek its own. Whew. Watch. This is a good barometer. Love takes no account or recognition of the wrong done to it then why are we so busted up by each other? Why is 99% of a pastor's counseling people troubles? People having trouble with people. Why are our marriages so hurting if love takes no account? Maybe we're Christians for other reasons. Maybe we want favor. Maybe we want blessings. Maybe we just are scared to die and want to end up in the right place when our, our eyes open. I don't know. I'm not answering for you. I'm just throwing out some thoughts. But I know this. It says love takes no account of the wrong done to it. You gave me a mic. I'm a preacher. I'm going to talk about it. No account, Chris. It takes no account of the wrong done to it. That's telling me my heart never has permission to be outside of love. Never has permission to feel sorry for myself. It's the biggest trap on the planet. I only knew how to feel sorry for myself when it was about me. Could you imagine Jesus feeling sorry for himself for three seconds? It would ruin everything. 
Could you picture him just dropping the cross and freaking out? Can't take no more? Come on, it's brutal. They're beating him beyond description, and he's totally perfect. He's never done nothing wrong. He has total love. He's given his life for these people, and those same people are mocking him and spitting on him and beating him till you can't recognize him. And not one blow is one too many to change his mind. Because love never fails. Come on. He could be hanging there freaking out if he wasn't love. Are you kidding me, God? How could they do this? I know it was planned before time. I know it was supposed to be this way. But man, now that I'm here seeing it head on, it's pretty freaky to see people this deceived. Come on. I mean, they released Barabbas. He killed a man. I raised the dead. And they want to kill me? He causes conspiracy. I'm trying to make peace here. Sounds like he's got a lot of issues if he's not love. Sounds like when you're totally right, you're probably right. But he doesn't rule his kingdom right. He rules it righteous. And that makes wrong things right. And gives the chance for things that have been wrong to be right. Oh, oh I'm going to. Oh, I feel the gospel all over me right now. We've all been wrong, right? If God came right and wrong, we're just wrong. He came righteous. He came saying, hey, I know the truth about you. You don't have a clue. Forgive them, Father, they... It looked like they knew. The Bible says some of them didn't even believe him. The Bible said some believed him and didn't acknowledge their belief because they feared men and didn't want to get kicked out of the synagogue. There was a lot of things the Bible exposes about men when Jesus was on the earth. Jesus didn't discern all that and try to figure all that out and analyze all that. He just said, Father, they're blind. If they knew who they were and if they knew who we were and who they were in us, they wouldn't be doing what they're doing. Forgive them. They're, they're deceived. I'm the light of the world. I'm going to be lifted up and draw all men to me. Draw all men to eternal life. Draw all men to me. Draw all men to benefit, protection, blessing, favor, provision. Draw all men unto me. Follow me. <gasps> so what do he do? He came as a man. It freaks me out. I'm 25 years in, guys. I talk about it all the time. If you listen to YouTube, I talk about it a lot. It freaks me out that God would come as a man. That God would be so humble and so in love with us and in love with our destiny, our purpose and our potential and our true identity that he would be willing to come as us without becoming like us, pay the price for us to get us back to him. Freaks me out. He's God. He's God. And he puts himself in the womb of a woman and doesn't take a shortcut. He comes as a man. He's curled up in her womb for nine months. That's incredible! <laughs> this, don't let this be some Christmas Easter thing. Don't get desensitized with tradition and stories. We're talking about God, the Son of God, who nothing was made that wasn't made through Him, who was and is and is to come, who was with God from the beginning. He was the Word, He was with God, and He is God. We're talking about Jesus, the Lord. He has Holy Spirit put him in the womb of a woman. That's how much he thinks of you and your potential and your destiny and your life. And you're going to find your identity through a family member who was dysfunctional. You're going to keep trying to drink out all these dry cups and stay thirsty when he said, if you'd have asked me, I'll give you a drink and one drink. You'll never thirst again. He's talking about identity. He's talking about finding yourself through him and stop drinking out of all these other fountains. If you'd ask me for a drink, I'll give you a drink. Because up and out of me flows living water. You'll drink one, one drink, one truth, one revelation. Ding, ding, ding. 
and you'll never, you see what's wrong with me? Do you see why I'm a madman every time you see me? Every video, I can't hold back the passion, why? I'm not trying the passion. If I'm trying the passion, then I'm a great actor, somebody ought to give me some kind of Emmy or some kind of whatever. I don't walk through that door and leave here and go, man, that was intense and feel all wore out because I had to put on a good show. I can't not be this way. I don't know how to be anything. You say, calm down. You have no clue. You don't even know what you're asking. <laughs> it's good tidings of, yeah. And I don't know that there's a lot of great joy. Not comparing, challenging, judging. What I'm saying is we're letting circumstances decide who we are and how we are. And then our prayer life involves God changing our circumstances instead of communion and union with him where we become more like him. And all of a sudden we have a prayer list instead of a fellowship. <sighs> so I'm a madman and I can't help it. I'm this way every time you'll see me. If you haven't seen me for five, seven years, I was this way. I might be a little worse now because I'm a little more in him. My hair's a little wider. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So even though I knew last time, now I know. In about five more years, man, I'm going to know. About five more years, ridiculous how I'll know. (laughs) And through all those years, a hundred circumstantial opportunities to be something else, but not one opportunity in my heart. Because I see. Because now I understand why I'm alive. And the days of you hurting me have ended. The days of my wife getting under my skin. I am not married to my wife for her to love me. I'm married, I'm in covenant to love her like Christ loves his church. I'm on the earth to love you, not need you. The day I need you, you'll let me down. It'll be your fault. I'll justify not being like Christ. I'll use you as my reason. Well, I'd be more in the spirit if it wasn't for... I didn't know that wasn't for example was Lord I didn't know that person was Lord why are you letting them govern you why is one person deciding you and it's not Jesus you don't know who I'm married to well he wants to be married to you are you making it easy for him wonder if he took your initiative and responded to you like you respond to your spouse wonder if Jesus treated you like you treat others you say well he won't He's love. Yeah, you're supposed to be love. If he loved us this way, ought we not love one another? Anyone who loves has no cause for stumbling because of his brother. It's 1 John 2. It's there. (laughs) 1 John 4 says, Beloved, let us love one another. Why? Because love is of God. The whole chapter, he is love. He is love. He is love. 1 John 4, 7 and 8. Beloved, let us love one another. Why? Because God is love. And everyone who loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He who loveth not, just doesn't know God. He didn't say you don't go on a mission trip. He didn't say you don't feed the hungry. He didn't say you don't pastor or lead worship. But he did say this. If you don't love, there's one reason, not two. Or not one of two. If you don't love, there's one reason you don't know him like you could. Which means I can't know him, genuinely know him, without being so influenced by him that who he is begins to wear off on me. Jesus said, this is eternal life. Not a prayer to take you to heaven. This is eternal life that you might know him, the only true God, and his son, Jesus Christ, whom he sent. You get it? Yay. (laughs) You probably don't need any more than this, right? I mean, the service before I got up here was already enough. (laughs) All weekend, Lord. (laughs) We got multiple sessions left, don't we, my brother? It's going to keep coming because we're here for this reason. Why do we gather? Why do we not forsake the assembling of ourselves together? It's not because of COVID (laughs) that we forsake. We come together, and we're not doing it, and we're not in rebellion. There's a reason we gather together. The Bible says the number one Bible reason you do not keep yourselves from assembling is in order that you stay stirred up and keep yourself stirred up in love and good works. It's not because you knew one of the speakers was kind of prophetic and you thought you might get another word. (laughs) 
It's not because you're sick and this is a healing conference and you're hoping you get healed. If that's in your heart and that's a motive, fine. But the real number one Bible reason, see, because if we don't preach this, we're just going to keep coming to God for what we can get from Him instead of what we can become because of Him. And if you let those things stay weak in your life, these testimonies will never be yours because you'll see them for the more spiritual. You'll be distracted in the moment. You'll be sitting on an airplane and instead of hearing for the person beside you, you're more worried because you might miss your connection and you're thinking way ahead and you got yourself all... But it's not your life. And you love not your own life unto death and you don't seek your own. So it's not fun to miss a connection when you fly all the time. It's great to make your connection. But I never saw Jesus change through a missed connection. But I've saw people change. <laughs> but the whole time people are changing, he's the same. So there's just something powerful about not loving your own life unto death. Because if all these things happen, because then somebody treats you rude, all of a sudden you can't get over it, somebody just pulls out in front of you in a highway, and, you, and it was just a bad move, and you're screaming, saying, you need to take your driver's test. I'd swear if I wasn't a Christian. <laughs> <laughs> and you're like mad for the next two miles because they made a mistake. Wonder if you made a mistake in life and God sat up there and freaked out. <laughs> freaked out. And then you try to talk to him and say, loser. <laughs> Come on, I'm just saying, some of us don't want God to treat us like we've treated each other. And we better get this point. The, the reason that he loves us like this is to overwhelm us with this love so that we become the very thing. I've said this my whole Christian life and ministry. If we as God's people fail to become love, we'll fail to step into the whole reason Jesus died on the cross. Jesus did not die on the cross to take you to heaven. I, I'm telling you that bold with a camera running. It's not heresy. His motive, his highest motive wasn't to take you to heaven. It was to he get heaven back into you. Amen. Jesus died on the cross to restore the truth. He came to save that which was lost, not who was lost. He came to save the thing Adam forfeited through sin. So he took care of sin to get the image of God back in man so we could walk in the light as he's in the light. He said, you are the light of the world. Watch. So any attitude that hinders the light, any belief that hinders the light, any motive that hinders the light is a deception and outside of the purpose of why you're here. Now you're not walking in grace and you don't feel empowered and now life seems like a grind and now you spend your whole life trying to get by or in survival and even use God to seemingly do that. It's all deception. Throw it all away. It's a bad idea. You said, but you don't understand. I'm in a house of five and everybody's against me. Nobody wants Jesus. The whole time they feel against you and seem against you and are against you, Jesus doesn't change. You do not have to change because your whole house is going some other direction. It takes one to pursue peace. It takes two to tango. And I'm not talking about an old dance that I don't know how to do. I'm talking about scrapping and fighting, tension. Come on, animosity. Isn't it amazing how we think in every disagreement there has to be tension? That's because there's self-centeredness unaddressed in our lives. We get offended if our spouse doesn't agree with us. We think they owe us more. They should agree with us. We, there's push and shove. There's control issues. There's manipulation. There's silent treatments. Hey, are you okay? Fine. Fine. Oh, come on. You, are you still mad about... Not mad. Hmm? Fine. Fine. What do you want? You want toast? Yeah. Hmm? Hmm? <laughs> Come on. That's control and manipulation. You're actually bearing witness that you don't know Jesus like you could, even though you lead in worship. So all of a sudden, what you do in his name takes the place of knowing him. And all of a sudden, your identity is wrapped around ministry instead of life in Christ. And that's why people live high and low. And the day of the righteous grows brighter and brighter. Y'all good? I gave you a whole weekend worth already. I feel it. I just feel like the Lord just went, pow, 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 pow. Are you okay? I hope you're okay because this is good news. 
You know the best news ever? You're not trapped living for yourself. You have a real big good option to not live for yourself. You say, how do I do that? You get alone when nobody's looking. It's not just some altar call. It's when nobody's looking. And you begin to talk to him and commune with him and thank him for loving you. Thank him for forgiving you. Thank him for accepting you. That sure beats saying, I'm not sure how much God could love me. Well, I hope I'm forgiven. We're going to find in the end, and this isn't harsh. This is just truth. In the end, what it's going to boil down to is who believed and who didn't believe. Who, just like a child, said, thanks. And who came up with a mindset to talk themselves out of him? Belief versus unbelief. In the end, you're not going to be able to blame it on your spouse or a devil or circumstance or God. You think you're going to stand before God someday and say, well, why did you change my spouse? I prayed for years and, and then you, you just left them. You aren't even going to be able to think that in the light of his glory and truth. Not because he's almighty and majesty, he's truth. All darkness will be real. You're going to step into that and go and see the deception instantly. And go, oops. <laughs> so don't blame shift. Don't justify. If you find yourself in a language justifying where you're at when where you're at doesn't look like Jesus, absolute deception. Why do you need an alibi to stay where you're not created for? Why do you need to use somebody's excuse or some other excuse to stay here where you're not flourishing, prospering, and multiplying him? Why do you need a justification for your attitude and your feelings when it's not love? Well, it's not my fault. I wouldn't be here if they didn't. Okay, but why are you giving them so much power to make you where you are? Why don't you come out of that into the light? Why are you letting that matter more than this? Are you following me? Come on. In the end, it's going to boil down to what you believed is how you lived. Not what you sang. Not what you quoted in your devotional. What you believed is what you lived because you know them by their fruits. That's fair. Is that fair? You're a preacher. Is that, is that fair or is that hardcore? That's fair. You change what you believe through the word of God. His word is truth and through Jesus' life. He manifested, he modeled a life that we were created for. If you can't find what you believe in his life, Throw it out of your belief system. If the language that you're speaking, the mind that you're thinking in, if you can't put it in Jesus and make it fit, then it's out of the box out there. You see what I mean? You, you follow him. You look at him and you look at his life. This is what I was getting at. He put himself in the womb of a woman. He came as a man. He didn't take a shortcut. He came as a man to fulfill what man failed to pay the price, shed his blood, so the blood of a man, not the blood of God, the blood of a man is on the mercy seat in the heavenly tabernacle. Now, I could take a long time and teach on that. Some of you don't totally get that, but that's incredible. Like, this isn't the temple made with hands. This is the heavenly tabernacle, the holy place of God Almighty. Jesus went in there with his own blood. Paul said there's one mediator between God and man. He didn't say Jesus, the Son of God. He said the man, Jesus. People want to crucify you for preaching like this, and it's the most powerful part of the gospel, that Jesus would lay down his reputation and lay down his glory and humble himself to the point of death and even death on a cross coming in the likeness of sinful flesh, yet never sinning. Fulfilling the law, taking it out of the way. He didn't come to break it, he came to fulfill it. And then he got a passing grade for everyone that comes through him. So he took the test for you, A plus, A plus, A plus, A plus, all the way across. And you bow before him and he knights you in righteousness and you stand up one with the living God. Huh? That's a big deal. So, so this is how we learn. So we go, oh my goodness, I've been homeschooled in the wrong home. I've been taught by self-centeredness. I've been ruled and reigned by the wisdom of the world. He said, if any of you are wise in this age, let him become a fool so he can become wise. 
See? So if you don't renounce everything you've ever learned as nothing, you'll never know. If you try to mix the two, sour, bad, poison drink. You don't bring Jesus into your life. It's not Jesus incorporated. He becomes your life. You can't pour new wine into the old wine skin. No wonder it's always spilling out. You've got to make the skin new. You've got to deny yourself. You've got to pick up your cross. You've got to get alone. Your question, ma'am, you've got to get alone when nobody's looking. Watch this. And say stuff like this out of your mouth with faith. Nobody owes me a thing, Lord. Man, my day, my attitude, how I'm doing, my disposition was dominated by so many things outside of you. I'm getting it now. I am done being that way. I, I yield, and all of a sudden, nobody's in the room. You're either out of your mind, you should go get a hobby, or you're on point and Jesus is there. Whew. See, I don't believe I'm out of my mind. I believe I'm out of some of yours. <laughs> That's what I believe. <laughs> And you kneel when nobody's looking. And you seek him who's in secret. And he who's in secret will see you there and reward you in the open. What are you seeking in secret? Him. What's your reward in the open? Him. <laughs> this thing is amazing. So you're going, Lord, I'm, I just done being manipulated. I realize it. Man, I put expectations on people. I've been insecure. I've needed people to encourage me. I'm trying to find my identity this way. Oh my goodness, I'm finding my identity through you. You always made me be to be your daughter. You always created me to shine. I was always in and never out in your heart. No, my darkest day, you didn't lose sight of who I am. In fact, nobody comes to you unless they're drawn by you. And I have a desire for you. You've been drawing me because you want me. I'm not an accident. I'm not a throwaway. I'm not a mishap. Oh, I might have done a lot of things wrong back there, but you're changing me. You're renewing my mind. Oh, my goodness, no longer conformed, but being transformed. Thank you. Nobody owes me a thing. I am honored to be alive in you. I am honored to walk in love. Thank you for the freedom that comes into my soul and my emotions from selfless living. God, no longer is there strongholds and bondages and, and loopholes. Man, and now you're on your knees and ain't nobody looking. I just deny myself and yield myself to you. Holy Spirit, I welcome you. Thank you for growing me up into him in all things. That's communion. That's prayer. That sure beats, could you please make the car run? And I hope the boss ain't a jerk today. And I hope I don't have to work beside Billy if you love me. <laughs> and then you call it prayer. Oh, yeah, I prayed today. <laughs> me, myself, and I. <laughs> me, myself, and I went before the throne. Whew. I'm supposed to be done soon. So I'm going to quit because i got a whole lot of time tomorrow. Tom's good to me. God, Tom gave me time tomorrow. You know why I say good to me? Not because I have a need to preach. Man, i got things in my heart. It feels happy to preach, good to preach. See, if I, I, if I wasn't standing in front of you, I'm going to preach to somebody. <laughs> but it's pretty cool when you guys are hungry. We're sitting in worship. How sweet was that? Room's like, and my buddy Jeremiah, who I miss, and now I see him, and he's up there letting it rip. And, ah, and I'm, we're smiling back and forth a little bit. And all of a sudden, the room just goes, woo, woo. And all of a sudden, everybody's believing the same thing. Like, everybody actually believes Jesus is, like, awesome. You start talking about freedom, and everybody actually believes we can be free. And you can just feel it. It's like, man. And then you're going to let me put on a mic and talk into that kind of hunger? That's fun. So, so thanks. Because I tell people, man, I preach to a tree. You know, preach to every living thing. You know, you just walk by a tree. Dude, you're amazing. I don't think anybody has bark quite like you. Like, yeah, I'd wave my branches too if I were you. Come on, man. <laughs> you will preach to a tree, man. <laughs> just... Your life's in Christ. You don't have issues. You have an answer. I think we think we're loaded down with all these troubles and we're waiting to catch a break. Come on. Some of our prayer list alone reveals our motive in life. It's not wrong to believe for things, for family and love, but some of our prayer lists alone, it's dangerous because our prayer list is contingent on our disposition. Who knows it's not fun if your child goes wayward? 
But when you lose your identity through your child going wayward, it means you don't understand. And you're drawing your identity through your child, and now you have an identity of a parent who didn't do well, or if you'd have done better, or all your mistakes are before you, and all of a sudden this is like the season of judgment, and, you're just, and now you can't even shine light because you become a product of your wayward child. And I promise you, the whole time they're wayward, Jesus hasn't changed, neither has your purpose. And, and here's why it's so important. And I'm not talking about denial and putting on a happy face and stuffing feelings. I'm talking about not even relating to those feelings that bring death. I'm talking about walking in a bedroom prophetic and seeing vision and seeing beyond the backsliding and declaring and staying productive and going to work and nobody can tell your child's wayward. Why? Because Jesus is profuse in you and he's shining through you and you're still clicking and clear and you're still getting discernments and, and you say, well, my child won't even hug me, so hug everybody else's. You're going to tell me your child's more important than your neighbor's child? They're both worth the blood and they both have the call of eternal life in the image of God. Let's stop coveting what is our own and let's see the value of everything. Come on, there was a season both my kids I couldn't hug. There was a season my wife, I couldn't even talk to her. And it looked like my family was destroyed. Jesus didn't change one bit. And I didn't go to bed feeling sorry for myself, and I didn't wake up waiting to see if they were changed and hoping someday they'd love me. Yeah. That's why I'm an aggressive madman when I talk about this stuff. Because it's not my doctrine. It's not my spiritual principles. It's my experience. It's my life. It's what I've walked through with him. So nobody can tell me you can't walk in love. Nobody can tell me that you have to give up after a while. You can't convince me. I lived for eight years in a marriage where I was like eight years married, but kind of like single. But married, not single. You say, well, that's going to be hard. She ain't giving you attention. She ain't giving you affection. I am so overloaded with attention and affection. <laughs> I put away the flesh, remember? So I could live in the spirit, remember? And to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge is to be filled with all the fullness of God. That doesn't sound like lack. If you're getting married for another person's touch, you're probably going to feel unsatisfied. If you're getting married to give yourself in love to bring the highest best out in that person, you're probably going to know the love of God. Yeah. So here we are all these years later. Both my kids are doing great. My wife is amazing. She's probably the most kindest, giving, sensitive, hearted person I know on the planet. And I'm not saying that because I'm supposed to. You would want her to pray for you. You would want her to weep for you. She has that kind of heart. She's amazing. And she would lay down her life for me because through all the hell, God has shifted and now she realizes she's been loved by God. She would die for me. My wife would die for me. She would lay down her life. She goes out of her way just to bless me and owes me nothing. She wouldn't have to do a thing. I'll think I'll be blessed, period. See, this even sounds weird. She's away right now for three weeks, but I don't know how to be lonely. I love her, but I don't know how to miss her to the point where I'm dysfunctional or disjointed because the love I have for her is super healthy and it's not self-centered, and I'm so excited that she's with her sisters and having a blast, and I don't know what loneliness is. She could be away for four months. I'm not going to be gnawing. And it's because I love her. A lot of like we cry, but it's because I love them. Yeah, you love them for you. You love them for what they give to you. You love them for what you get from them. You love them. It's a need thing. It's I need you, really. You know the flip side and the perversion on the flip side? The person away wants you to miss them. Because they need you to need them. It's codependent dysfunction. It all has to do with the fall of man. None of it's cool. It's all psychological, but none of it's Jesus. It's weird. But you didn't miss me? You didn't even miss me. No, I was good. Man, I can't believe you didn't miss me. And you just want to say, oh, I missed you so bad. And then quote some kind of poetic through the throes of the night and the dryness of the barrenness and now the watery springs of your love and get some kind of weird, I don't know. And you, ah, ah, ah. 
Nope, didn't miss you. Not supposed to. <laughs> sure prayed for you. Sure glad you're back. Sure good to see your beautiful face. Love you a whole bunch, but nope, didn't miss you. <laughs> not in a weird way. Not in a... But you know how people need you to need them like that? That's the flip side of the perversion. And there's a whole lot of people that go to church that live that way so we have a hard time representing him and it doesn't make us ambassadors. Y'all with me? I said plenty tonight. Uh, yeah, I got to wrap up. We got to do this quick because I'm supposed to be done at a certain time. I got an email. It told me when to be done. <laughs> Since I quoted this ambassador thing a couple of times, Second Corinthians 5.14, for the love of Christ compels us. What compels us? The love of Christ, not the fear of death, not my eternal destination. The love of Christ is what compels us. Because we judge something, not someone, we judge something. That if one died, if one died, then all died. Or if, he died, or if one died for all, then all died, right? So if one died for all, then all died. Watch. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him no longer that way. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not giving them what they deserve, imputing their trespasses, right? He has committed to us this same word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Why? Because he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become right in the sight of God and the righteous expression of God. That's what that means. Isn't that amazing? So I actually read out of the Bible. Right at the end, I pulled it off. So if anybody was waiting and ready to discard everything I said because I didn't read out of my Bible, gotcha. <laughs> so now you got to jump in. Thank you. Let's, ooh. See if that's the Lord, because I'm waiting. Because <laughs> I want to do something, and I usually don't get stopped. I usually have a, you know, you, you, the will of God is, is, is beautiful when you hear it, and then sometimes he just lets you do things you want to do because he's cool with it. And this is a, this is a city quake, and we pray for the sick stuff, and I usually, normally, I was just going to pray for the sick and do it a certain way, and I didn't feel like I was supposed to right now. So that's uh, different. So that's why I hesitated. Then I heard the phone ring. I thought maybe... The hotline was up. I was like, okay, I need a phone call, Lord. Because it's easy to pray for the sick, and I, and I got convictions in my heart and things. But you know, what I'm, you know what I'm, as I'm talking, you know what I'm kind of feeling in my heart right now? That we're just supposed to commit to this word as individuals and corporately walk this thing out, and that's what the army is that's on the earth. But let's just pray a couple of things here, and let's just see what happens, okay? Could, can you... Be sincere tonight before the Lord, not before man, not standing up, not coming to an order. 
I'm talking about sincere before the Lord. You, your heart, your conscience. I'm not talking about before man. I'm not talking about a hand raised or standing at your seat. I'm not talking about crying and kneeling up front. I'm just talking about you and Jesus, whether you kneel, stand, cry. Just you and him. Can you, with all your heart, say with all your heart tonight, you know what I hear this man saying? I bear witness. I recognize it as truth, life-changing, and I want to live this way. And I really don't want any other option. I just want to live this way. And Lord, I, I'm going to start with that. I'm going to ask you to father me there, convict me there, and grow me there. Is that fair enough? Would you be willing? See? So you know if you're willing. Here's the, here's the paradox. In a room this size, there's always a whole handful. You say, don't say that, Pastor. It's negative. Nope. It's just there's a whole handful of people that don't want to become love. They want to hold on to the rights they inherited through Adam, the attitudes they learned in the earth, and they hold on to themselves and continue to go to church. And they stay hurt and offended, and they find their identity through the things they do instead of who they've become. Just make sure that's not you. And if there'd be nobody left in the room in that category, that would be awesome, wouldn't it? So it's not that I'm saying it's not possible. So you know where you're at right now. Would you get before the Lord in your heart? Would you tell him that you're all in? And the way Tom prayed over me in the beginning, that was my, my closet prayer when I was a baby, baby, baby Christian. Tom didn't even know that. That all that is mine is yours so that all that you are, you could be in me. I think it's okay if you pray that prayer from your heart tonight. You're not stealing my prayer. Would you do that right now with the Lord if you're serious in your heart? Would you tell him that everything you are, you're yielding to him the best you understand. You're giving it to him so that all that he is, he can be in you. So that you could be an ambassador and rightly represent him without trying so hard, without labor, without pressure, without fear of failure. That you, like an innocent child, could just manifest your father's love. If you haven't been living that way in your marriage, hey, you can, you can get all in right now. You say, man, I don't know. I don't think my spouse, it, stop. It's not, I'm not even talking about your spouse. I'm talking about you. I'm talking about you starting where love is. And if you're both sitting together tonight and it's been testy in the home, why don't you grab each other's hands as a sign of forgiveness and say, you know what, let's start here and let's put behind us yesterday. You'd be amazed the healing power that will come on your relationship if you'd be humble and just take hands. Without being acknowledged, without an order call, without any counsel, without anybody praying over you, you just take your spouse's hand as a sign of saying, you know what, I know I haven't been living the way this man's talking and I'm sorry, but man, it sounds exciting and I want it. And you're not asking them to forgive you. You're saying, forgive me. Man, you squeeze their hand back. I'm telling you, there's a grace that will come right there on your marriage. Yeah, that's great. So, Father, I just pray over this house right now. I pray over this room, and I ask this conviction to stay strong, to not fade. And we are literally asking you, Holy Spirit, would you help us walk out this life called love? And in any way we're distracted, any way we're deceived or thinking wrong, like the sister asked, how do we get there? If in any way, Lord, we get on a road that we're not even meant to travel, would you just realign us, guide us, and get us back on track? Because we know you love us. You paid for us while we were yet sinners. Surely you'll lead us now by your Spirit. So I ask for reconciliation tonight in marriages and relationships. I ask, Lord God, that tonight would be just a foundation-setting night to just walk out a life of love. That this would be a turning point for some in the room, uh, an adding point or a strengthening point uh, for some just an initial, wow, I need this. God, would you establish it all through the room? The reason I'm alive is to shine. You have made us the light of the world. And we are ambassadors of Christ. Let that grace rest on us. In Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Amen. Uh, yeah, I, I, I wanted to pray for the sick. I don't feel like I'm supposed to right now. I think we're supposed to just quit on that word. Are you okay? Sorry, guys, about that. I just, I can't fight that. I just, I don't, I rarely get a strong no like that. That's why I went, ooh, and I, the phone rang and I had fun with it. I thought, that's the Lord. <laughs> Bless you, love you, thank you. There's Mr. Yeah. Tom. Amen. Okay. So that's exactly what I was feeling, Dan, that, that 
it's, it's so easy to like, okay, the service is over. What are we going to do? Go out and get something to eat, whatever. I, I just encourage you that there's, I know that with many of you, there's like God really spoke to you through Dan tonight. And you just might need to go home or go back to your hotel or wherever you're staying and just, and just spend some time with him and, and get a good night's sleep with him and just let this sink in. I mean, it's just determine what you're going to do right now. Don't, don't like decide after your friend says, hey, let's go do something. Over there. Decide right now. What do you need to do about that for tonight? How do you need to meditate on that and just to kind of clear up or think about or pray through some of those things? Because there was a lot in that, obviously. So just let that seed sink in deep and, and, and take that time and so I just encourage, for many of you, you just need to, like I said, go get alone somewhere for a little bit and then just fall asleep with your Abba Daddy and just, just receive, put that head on your pillow and say, Lord, I'm so glad you love me so much. I'm so glad you love me so much. I need to become like you, Jesus. I just need to become like you. And then just go to sleep with that and wake up with the joy of the Lord, and that he's going to transform you. You're not overwhelmed like, oh, man, I have so far to go. He's going to transform you. Faithful is he who called you. He'll bring you to pass. He's, the, he's not called the author and perfecter of our faith for nothing. Okay? So just, just trust. He's going, to, he's going to do this in you. It's, like, amazing. So God bless you. Uh, head, on, uh, head on out. Come back. We'll be back here 9 a.m. tomorrow with worship and more Dan Moeller. Bless you.